Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop here on Plummer Avenue. It is snowy here on Boxing Day in Seattle, so with not much else to do, tobogganing all done, time to go back indoors and write some assembly language. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer a retired operating systems engineer going back to the MS Dawson Windows 95 days. And today, we're going even further back than that to take a look at some 8-bit assembly language. Back in the 80s, I was a professional game developer working for a time in 6502 assembly language, and that's the subject of today's episode. Recently, I produced an episode on the Commodore D9090 10 megabyte hard drive, which you absolutely should check out next if you haven't seen it yet. The hard drive, of course, needs a host computer to be useful, and that host was the venerable Commodore PET. Now, I have a few PET 2001s around my house these days, and one of the few useful functions that they can still perform is acting as a highly accurate 24-hour clock. Of course, they're really only accurate once you add a real-time clock chip of some kind, but that's a tale for another day. Because, of course, the goal today isn't simply to turn a computer that used to cost thousands of dollars into what is fundamentally a $2 table clock. My actual goal is to show you an entirely functional assembly language application, but written to the coding standards of today, from start to finish. We'll go through the code and see how the time of day is read from the clock, how it's parsed out, and ultimately displayed graphically on the screen. We want the letters to be large and readable. To that end, we're going to make them up out of jumbo letters consisting of regular text characters. For example, to create the number 8, you might use stars to draw the larger number. We'll do much the same thing except create ours with solid blocks rather than just stars for an even bolder appearance. To draw a clock, then, we need certain basic steps. We need to be able to clear the screen. We need to be able to retrieve the current time of day and convert the time of day into four simple digits that we actually care about. Two numbers before a colon representing the hours and two after it representing the minutes. We don't show the leading zeros on the hours. Then we draw those clock digits as large block letters on the screen. And now to those very basics, we need to add a few simple additional requirements. Like we should be able to adjust the time somehow, and we should move the display around to avoid burning it into the screen. Because if I just displayed the time of day with this bold high contrast character set in the middle of the CRT screen and left it that way for days, weeks, or months, the electron gun would eventually wear its way into the phosphor coating in the monitor in a permanent fashion. To avoid that, we want our display to wander around the screen so it's not always being drawn at the same place. To be able to draw our large digits, we'll first hand plot the numbers we need onto graph paper and then draw them accordingly by placing text characters onto the screen in the right places. On the PET, just as with the Commodore 64 that would come a few years later, the PET video hardware is so simple and basic that there's really not much to talk about. The screen is comprised of 25 lines of 40 characters each, and the character in each cell is chosen from a variation of the ASCII character set known as PETSKI. Petsky contains the regular letters and numbers, but also a set of proprietary Commodore graphic symbols that we won't be using today. Well, except for one, because we're going to use the inverse of the space, which is actually a square. The 1,000 bytes of screen characters are simply standard main memory locations, starting at location 8,000 hex. So to put an A in the top left corner of the screen, we simply put the value of 65, which is the character code for A, in memory at that location, and the video chip does the rest. To move down the line, we just advance by 40 bytes, as there's 40 characters in a line. But there's no input output or fancy instructions needed. You just put the right text in a memory wherever you want it to appear. Now, as just a bit of historical context, if you're curious about how the system knows when you've actually made a change to memory that needs to be drawn, it's because the entire display is redrawn entirely 60 times a second, no matter what. The video chip gets half-time access to the memory or at least the video memory section. So, 60 times per second, it scans through the memory, redrawing the screen with any characters on it, while blocking the CPU's access to that memory. But it's actually on a 2 MHz clock that's divided, 1 MHz going to the CPU and 1 to the memory, so they don't actually compete that much. Long story short, the CPU gets access to the memory the other half of the time. We don't have to worry about that time division, and from our point of view, we simply store characters in memory at will, and the rest happens magically. Our first task is to clear the screen. And if you've already made a guess as to how we're going to do that, you're probably right. Because perhaps you would store 32, the character code for space, in each of the 1,000 screen cells. And that's precisely what we need done. But what's the quickest and easiest way to do that? We could loop through those 1,000 cells in code, storing a 32 in each one, and that would be perfectly valid. 
But back in the 80s, every byte was sacred, and you didn't want to duplicate code that the system already had. So it's a fair bet that the system already contains code to clear the screen somewhere. And sure enough, all you need to ultimately do is ask the system to print the code for clear screen out to the console. When it sees you trying to do that, it runs the clear the screen code for you. So that's an incredibly brief way to clear the screen. Simply load up CLR screen into a register and call care out. But behind the scenes, that's going to somewhere call the system code to do the actual clearing. Thus, we could be smarter still and just call that subroutine ourselves, if we can find it in the system kernel. And thanks, no doubt, to an old table I had that I'm sure Jim Butterfield had something to do with, on a path running BASIC 4, that location turns out to be E015. Now, our clear screen function simply becomes a subroutine call to the system's own clear screen function. It's just two instructions, JSR clear screen and then RTS back to the caller. But if we want to be really efficient and a little less readable, we could actually change it to be just jump clear screen. But why? Because if you look at the code to clear screen, the last thing it's going to do is to execute an RTS, or return from subroutine. If we change our own call to a jump, the return address on the stack is our caller. So at the end of the clear screen call, its RTS would actually return to our caller. It's super efficient, tiny, clever, and something I'm showing you only for the sake of proving that I know about such optimizations, but will not be making any of them today. That's because my goal today is not to impress you with how efficient and arcane I can make my assembly code. I want to write my code basically like it's 2022, not 1982. I know and you know that we've got at least 4K and probably 32K here to work with, and we're only doing a clock, so we don't really need to employ every last memory-saving trick at the expense of our code becoming just a little too clever for its own good. So with that preamble out of the way, let's get busy. I'm going to jump live into my editor of choice, Visual Studio Code. I have everything set up here for a nice little development environment. I'm using the CC65 cross-compiler project from GitHub to build my code. But I'm only using the assembler and linker from that package, not the C compiler yet. Now, I think it's valiant and amazing that there's a C compiler for 6502 at all. And if you'd like to see me experiment with it, by all means, let me know in the comments. For today, though, we're only worried about assembly. So I'll be using CA65, its assembler, and CL65, its linker. Now, as you can see, I have the code live up in front of me over there and the vice session showing my pet screen right below me. When I select Run Build Task, VS Code will fire off a build, which is really just an assembly and link. If successful, the pet program binary that results will be called petclock.prg, and it will be placed right in our folder next to our source code. But better yet, I've mapped that entire folder to be device 9 on the pet. Okay, if all goes well, I've got the folder on the Windows PC mapped to be the actual drive that shows up on unit 9 of the pet. So when I do a directory of U9 on the pet, I should see the contents of the source code folder on the PC. Let's see. DIR on U9. Sure enough, there it is. Now, there's no pet clock yet because we haven't built. So watch as I build, select, test, run, the whole deal. All right, it's compiling, it's assembling, it's now built. And if I do another dir, I want to make sure it's there. PetClock.prg, there we go. So I'll say deload, because I got basic four. PetClock.prg on U9. Whoops, if I take a listing, it's a remarkable clock by me, and a system call to 1076, which is where the assembly language code starts in memory. So if I run it, <laughs> my keyboard is as flaky today as a real pet. What? That's really weird. Because I always get that on the pet, but not on my PC. Anyway, there's my big block clock. So the actual code at the start of the assembly language file is all there in order to properly emit the basic stub and all that. It's actually pretty complicated, so it's going to be the last thing we look at. We're going to start with where the code starts. That's sys1076, which is actually a piece of code called start, which is where the label is. Let's go there, and that's the beginning of my assembly language, and we'll start there. So the first thing our code is going to do is turn off decimal mode in the CPU by calling the CLD instruction. I find the decimal mode a little esoteric, so I don't use it much. Next, we call init variables. What this is going to do is imagine we were in ROM. We couldn't just have all of our variables declared in line with us because we're in code and we're burned into ROM. You couldn't change variables that were burned into ROM. So you've got a reserve space elsewhere in the memory. And what we're going to use is pet buffer number two, which is where you would get a buffer if there is a second cassette drive, which is pretty uncommon on a pet. So it's a pretty safe area to use. 
I've got org 826, which means as far as the assembler is concerned, the current location of memory should be 826, and that is the secondary cassette buffer. The next thing we have is a label, which says here at 826, we're going to call that scratch start. And then we're going to reserve two bytes and call that clock count. We're going to reserve another byte, call that clock X pause. We're going to reserve another byte, and we're going to call that clock Y pause. So this is probably 826 and 27, 828, 829, and so on. We're not actually emitting any bytes into the binary or anything. We're just reserving space and memory and giving it a symbolic name. And this is a way that basically you create local variables or global variables, but they're non-initialized variables. BSS, if you prefer, instead of data. In fact, it's in the BSS section, so there you go. The next piece of uh, data that we've got is called the clock start. And it's just where the clock data starts, and it's where I keep the hours tens digit, the hours minutes digits, the minutes tens, the minutes ones, and so on. All the, all the components that make up the clock time. And finally, we have a very large structure, which is when you have a hardware clock connected to the PET, and I've got one on my PET, but we're going to simulate that here because we're actually on a PC emulator and it's hard to talk to a real IEEE 488 device from a Windows PC without an expensive emulator that's probably not supported by Vice anyway. So when we're in Vice, we're just going to copy a pre-canned response out, but that response will fit this template. So it will have a year and then a dash, then a month and a dash, then a day, and then the letter representing probably the day of the week hours, tens, hours, digits, and so on. But this is a lot more information than we need. That's why we've got our memory in a little separate area that I can just pull out the parts I need. And if you were using a different clock, like the Jiffy clock on the PET, you would then also be able to just kind of have this level of indirection and store data directly into that clock structure without this big uh, device structure if you didn't have an IEEE clock device. At the end of the memory area that I'm reserving for variables, I've got an assertion here that says, make sure that the end of the buffer minus the start of the buffer is 23, because I know that that's what that IEEE device emits, a 23-byte buffer. And if my code isn't 23 bytes, then something's wrong. Oh, the second assertion is to make sure that we haven't run past the end of the cassette buffer yet. Then finally, we've got code. Now we've got all this stub stuff that we talked about before, and then our start. So init variables, let's go look at what it actually does now that we know what the variables actually are. So init variables loads the X register with scratch end minus scratch start. And if you think about it, that is the length of the scratch area. So it's going to write the 30th byte with a 0, the 29th, 28th, 27th, work all the way back to 0, write the 0th byte of this buffer, and when it underflows to FF, this comparison will no longer be true, and it will fall through to here. It will then take the amount of clock bytes, load that into the X register, store a ASCII 0, not a binary 0, in each of the clock digits, because we don't need binary zeros, we need displayable digits in the clock. It will then decrement the X register until it underflows to FF, fall through, and return. The next function that's called is update clock. Everything after this point will be in the main loop, so this is the second and the last part of initialization. So when running against the hardware clock, what this does is it loads a Commodore device style string and it's going to pass it off to that device on a command channel. To do that, we load the low address and the high part of the address into registers, and then we call send command. But we're not going to do that while we're running under the emulator because we don't actually have the device attached. What we're going to do is we're going to get a fake response, which is a canned copy of one of the earlier responses. It's not that much different or easier. It's just something that's repeatable. That's why the clock's always going to say 923, because we're using a canned response. But it saves having to deal with the hardware clock for now. We'll look at that code if it's of interest later, but for now, all we're doing is copying a string, which is using the Y register. We're going to load from the fake response the YF byte, then we're going to store in the device response the YF byte, and we're going to, uh, what the heck are we doing? Oh, until one of those bytes is zero. So as long as those bytes is not null terminated, we're going to loop by incrementing Y and jumping back to here. All right, with the device response now in memory, whether it's from the fake response or for the actual device, it doesn't matter where we got it. Oh, I should actually show you what that response looks like. It's just a string that comes back from the device normally that has the year, the month, the day, uh, the hour, the minute, the second, and the day of the week. And so I've got a copy of that here, and to simulate the device, we're just going to copy this string into the output buffer whenever asked. All right, once we've got that response, we're going to take the hours, tens, and store it in our hours tens. We're going to take the clock's hours digits and store it in our hour digits. We're going to take the clock's minutes tens and store it in our minutes tens. 
So we're pulling selectively information out of that big device structure that we actually care about. Uh, we'd like that data to be contiguous, so we don't want to just refer to it in place in the clock structure. Now in America, we think there's too many hours in the day already, so we don't really believe in 24 hour time. We just like to do two 12 hour loops, it's less work. So to convert the 24 hour time back to 12 hour time, what we do is we check to see what the hours tens digit is. If it's a zero, well, that's pretty easy. If it's a two, we know we have some work to do. Uh, if not, we fall through knowing it's a one, and then we check to say, is it a 13 o'clock or higher? If it's 13 o'clock or higher, we're going to back up by 12 hours. If it starts with a two, that means there's a zero, there's a two in the tens place. We're gonna go to here. It's gonna be a little fancier, this section. So it's gonna decrement the hours tens twice, which is worth 20 hours. It's then going to take the hour digits, and it's going to add 8. Why 8? What's up with 8? Well, what it's actually doing is it's adding that 20 that we just got credit from the 10 digits, and then it's backing off 12 hours. So you're really adding 8. And it works out mathematically the same. And it's a much shorter calculation. It's handy. I may have invented it. Call the patent office if it's important. I oh, went further curious about the IEEE 488 device. This is the command that you would actually send to it. If you're trying to format a Commodore hard drive, you would send it N0 colon name comma ID0, stuff like that. To query the time from the real-time clock, you just send it T-RI. Once it sees that, it responds with that device string that included all the time information. All right, that's all the preamble. That's all the setup. That's all the nonsense. Now it's the bread and butter of actually looking at the clock and drawing it on screen. Now, each and every time we come through the main loop, we call draw clock XY with the current XY position of the clock. It starts out at 0, 0, and it will drift around from there. Let's go to draw clock XY to see how it does it. So it saves away the clock's X, and it saves away the clock's Y position. And it calls the magical clear screen function. Let's go see it. Yeah, 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 I did it. I did a jump to clear screen. It could be a JSR on RTS, but Raymond could be watching and he would see that I wasted an extra RTS and it would upset him during the holidays and I don't want to do that. All right, clear screen it is. Now we're going to do some drawing. The first thing we do is we get the hours tens digit. You'll notice, as it says 923 here, there is no hours tens digit. And yet, things somehow remain centered. What it does here is it checks to see if it's a zero. If it's not, it goes and draws, goes about its drawing. Otherwise, it's going to move it back one half of a character, which is four. Because each block character is eight regular characters wide, including a one character blank on the far left side, we need to back up by four, which is half of that, if we're not going to draw the hours digit, because we are that much narrower in total. I mean, it's a little extra work to remain symmetrical, but you got to be symmetrical, right? Because So the next thing we do, naturally, is draw the colon. Well, why would we draw the colon? Well, look how nice and narrow it is. This code actually draws the colon first, because the colon is just as wide as the other characters, and it would take up way too much space. So first I draw the colon, and then I draw the minutes a little bit to the left, and I draw the hours a little bit to the right, and then it takes up some room off of the colon, and it doesn't look so fat. It looks much better this way. So I draw the colon first, so other things can overlap it. To draw a big character on the screen, all you need to do is load the X and Y position and then load the accumulator with the ASCII character and call draw a big car or draw a big care. Extremely handy. That's where the bulk of the work is done. We'll get there soon. Next, we draw the first digit of the minutes then we draw the second hour digit and the first hour digit. So we're basically working our way out. And down at the end, our next function is in fact, draw big care. Draws a big care given the X, Y location. How does it do it? Well, it needs to know where in memory, given the 40 by 25 grid, that you want to actually do the drawing. Our character table is the literal, the colon, and then for example, and then the word of the address of the data that makes up the colon. So an entry for zero and a pointer to the data for zero, an entry for one and a pointer to the data for one, and so on. What's the data for one and zero and so on look like? Well, if you squint a little bit, you can see if the ones were set and the zeros were off, this would form a zero, and this mask would form a one. This mask would form a two. Hopefully you can see this mask forms a three, this one forms a four, and so on. What we're gonna do is we're gonna print these out basically on the screen or poke them into memory, but everywhere there's a one bit, we're gonna draw a solid block, and everywhere there's a zero bit, we're gonna draw a blank. 
So back in Draw Big Care, where the bulk of the action takes place, the first thing we do is get the cursor address to figure out where on the screen to draw it. Then we get where we're going to draw from memory. We just start with 7 as the bit count, and then we're going to work down. And as we go, we're going to take a bit mask starting at 1 in the most significant bit, and then working it all the way through the mask. And as we go across, we're going to say, well, hey, is it an on bit or an off bit? If it's an on bit, we're going to load 160 and store that in memory. If it's an off bit, we're going to load a blank space and store that in memory. ZP temp is, of course, a zero page pointer, which is the only way you can do pointers on a 6502. So there are no 16 bit registers other than the only the internal program counter and stuff like that is 16 bits. But in terms of user accessible registers, it's all eight bits. So if you want to make up a 16 bit pointer, you need to use two locations in memory. And it always has to be down in the first 256 bytes or zeros, the page zero of memory. So you take your two bytes in zero page memory and you use low byte, high byte, and you store your 16 bit quantity that way. And you can then indirect through it, indirect with a register appended to it, like we're doing here, comma Y. Uh, it's actually quite powerful. If you think of it in the right way, you actually have 128 16 bit registers. So when you hear people cry that the 6502 doesn't have any registers, well, it's true, it doesn't have any general purpose registers but it does have a crap ton of 16-bit pointers that you can use. But yeah, if you weren't familiar with zero page and you just thought, hey, it's got three registers, eight bits each, two of them aren't even general purpose, it'd be pretty limiting. But you can do a lot with all the zero page pointers. Nobody ever called them a pointer before. Now, now I'm talking your language, that's why. You just thought they were concatenated memory addresses that were weird, but no, now they're pointers and they make sense. Send money now. And so as we do each of these, it's either the 160 blank or the blank space. We then shift the bit mask right by one and repeat the same operation until we've hit the end, which is eight steps. Once we've done all eight bits, we advance 40 bytes in screen location because we're going to drop down one line on the screen. We don't change the uh, X location at all. We decrement the bit count because we've gone from the 7 to 6 to 5 to 4 to 3 to 2 to 1 as we, as we count down each of the rows that we're drawing. And until that hits 0, we loop. Once it does, we're done. So we return. This is one of those functions that kind of makes more sense the second time through. So now we've had an overview. Let me kind of go back through it quickly one more time. So it comes in. It gets the address on the screen that you're going to draw at. It's going to get the address from memory that it's going to copy that character from. And it's going to start and do all seven rows of the character. It works its way through with the bit mask going left to right, and then it works its way down, advancing by 40 characters each time, replacing ones that it finds in the bit mask with 160 and zeros with a space. That way, the big block characters that you saw in 0, 1, and binary are copied onto the screen and translated to blanks and blocks. When it's done, it returns back to the caller. Okay, back to the actual main loop now. You've seen the bulk of the code. The rest is kind of housekeeping and plumbing. So let's take a look at it. After we draw the clock, we're going to call a function that's going to decide whether or not it updates the clock position. As you can see, it does. It jumps around every few seconds. Let's go find that. And it's going to return the carry flag to indicate to us what it did. Carry flag if set indicated in return that the clock has moved. So when the carry is set, that's probably a good time to do any other periodic maintenance, like checking the keyboard or displaying instructions, that kind of thing. And we will as soon as we get back from this function. So what this is going to do, it's going to count up to 255 some number of times, basically 200 times. And once that's happened, it knows enough time has elapsed that it's time to move the clock again. There is a jiffy timer on the pet, but um, generally it's fine to hard count because everything is CPU cycle based anyway. So. If they come out one day with a pet that's twice as fast, it'll move twice as fast, but I don't foresee that happening. So, Notwithstanding the clock speed variability on a Commodore 128, but still, uncommon. So every time that countdown expires, we do two things. We update the clock X position to be the Jiffy timer, ended with three. What on earth is that doing? I have no idea. Let me think about this for a second. Why three? I could see if it was any bigger than three. So is this position within the byte, perhaps? Oh, I see what it's doing. The clock doesn't wander around the screen. Sorry, it's been like five years since I wrote this. Almost to the day, exactly. And uh, what it's doing, it's wandering around randomly in the middle. So it's only got a certain range that it can go within, and that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
And that's why it's ending it with three. It's taking the jiffy timer, ending it with just the bottom, get the bottom bits off it, and using that as the X pause offset. The Y, it's going to move from the top to the bottom until it reaches 15, which is about as low as it needs to go when you conclude the height of the clock itself and leave a little room for instructions at the bottom, and it resets to the top. So as you watch, it will randomly walk down the screen and then appear at the top again. Every other time it does one of those 255 increments up to 200, it's going to return and say, all's cool. But every so often it's going to say, hey, now is the time. I just moved the clock. So we'll use that opportunity to call get in. That will return zero if nobody's touched the keyboard. Otherwise, which in which case, if it is zero, we go back to the inner loop and just keep repeating this. Otherwise, we check to see what the heck got pressed. Was it three? Well, if not, then it wasn't escape because escape is three. If it was escape, we jump down to exit app. Makes sense? Pretty straightforward. If it's not escape, then we compare it to 48, which is capital H, or just the H key. And if it wasn't 48, we go to the next test. But if it was, we call increment hour and then jump back to the main loop. Similarly, if shift H was pressed, we decrement the hour and jump back to the main loop. If M was pressed, we increment the minute and jump back to the main loop. And I'm sure you're seeing a pattern here. Shift M, decrements the minute, jumps back to the main loop. Anything else is an unknown key, and so we show some basic instructions, which say press run stop to exit, I believe. In all other cases, we jump back to the inner loop. Let's go look at show instructions, which I don't think does much besides put a single string on the screen. All right, it uh, resets the clock count timer back to zero. I wonder if there's a comment as to why. Oh, good idea, Dave. Forgot about this. This is so that the uh, you don't hit it, and then right away the clock moves and clears the screen. So we want to, every time you tap a key, it's going to put up, or uh, tap a wrong key, it will put up the instructions and reset that move timer so you get at least a few seconds of the banner up on the screen. Otherwise, we take the address of this location on the screen, which is the screen memory plus 22 lines down, 22 times 40. This probably could be screen width instead of just hard-coded 40, but such is life. From there, it's going to copy data out of the instructions, index by Y, hit done, as soon as it comes back with a null terminator. In all other cases, it's going to convert Petsky, because my text is in ASCII for some reason. <laughs> Gotta figure out why that is. Convert to Petsky. Oh, because the assembler directive generates ASCII, but I need Petsky, so I need to convert it on the fly. Let's go look at what it does. Flips a bit, and I don't think there's an offset. I think it's just a bit change, isn't it? Here's a simple, goofy convert code to Petsky from ASCII code that's just handy because the assembler requires that you do your directives in ASCII, but the screen codes require you to be in Petsky, and rather than doing a manual hand conversion, I just put ASCII in the code and convert on the fly. So lastly, of all things, let's take a look at the clock adjustment code because it's got some interesting special cases, I think. So when we call increment minute, for example, we increment the minute's digits. We then compare it to 9 plus 1 the ASCII code for 9 plus 1, which is going to be whatever comes after 9 in the ASCII character set. We increment min digits. If min digits has not passed 9 by now being equal to 9 ASCII plus 1, we go to done. Otherwise, we store 0 in the minimum digits and we increment the minimum tens. Then we've got to check, well, did we roll past 5 in the minutes? And if so, we're going to fall all the way through to increment hour. And hour is going to do something very similar. If we increment the hour digits, it's going to roll over at 9, except for when you're doing the next ones, where it's got to handle 0 and 1 differently because of the 0, 1, 2 case. Any other interesting code here? Decrement works pretty much, obviously, largely backwards, as you might intuitively sense. But it has to do things like fill with 59 when you roll back through 0. So let's make sure that actually all works. So if I tap on the M key here, I can decrement my way. What happens next? What do you think? Boom! 859. Good job. Now what if I step past it? Going forward. Oh, I was hitting N, not M. I got instructions. Rolling forward works. So at least around the hour case it works. How long would it take me to get to the... No, key repeat on this. Oh, I can do hour, hour. Minute, 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 minute. Let's do a really degenerate case. We're going to roll over by minute going 11.59 to 12. OK, 
Okay, and then we're going to make sure that we don't get 13 o'clock, but rather 1 o'clock. Perfect. I've tested every case exhaustively. The code is proven perfect. The last thing we want to look at is the basic stub that allows this program to be loaded as a basic program rather than done with the on a pet. If you want to load a piece of machine code at a particular place of memory, you have to do load uh, binary name, comma, device number, comma, one, and that extra comma one specifies take the first two bytes of the file, use that as the load address, and put it there, please. You can then syscall right into that code once it's loaded into memory by using the basic sys command. And here we start at 00, zero logically. We then emit 16 bits being the address. We then org our code at that address. After the .org base, we put a word with the uh, address where line 20 begins. We then put 10 for line number 10. The token, I guess, is the better name for it, for the rem code. The actual string, archival clock by Dave PL. Then the address of the next line, which is going to be a zero. So it's end of basic. It's a word, zero, 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 zero. So that's the next line. The last line, which is not the next line, is again line 20, the sys token, a space, and then a literal string here. And this is some assembler fanciness that takes the current address, adds 7 to it because we have the byte and the words here, and winds up putting you at the right address. So you can't do a forward reference very well with this assembler. Otherwise, I would just put out the literal for start, but I wasn't having any luck with that. So I've got to do this current location plus 7. But that generates the system call to 1076, and all is well. Now, I don't have any Patreons. I'm just doing this for the subs and likes. So if you enjoy this kind of weird assembly language of look back, then please consider subscribing to the channel. Or if you already are subscribed, drop this one a like or leave a comment to let me know you're out there. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Hope I didn't bore you too much. This assembly language stuff is a little arcane, and I kind of wanted to skim over some of it and take a deeper dive into some of it. it wasn't my goal to teach it today. Just kind of show you how it works and what the problems you face are. So in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time right here in Dave's Garage.